Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and we are moving right along with James Longstreet's biography. Last time he fought the Battle of Antietam, and now the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia moved back into Virginia, and Longstreet would take part in the Battle of Fredericksburg. The battle did not continue the next day. George McClellan declined the fight, and Robert E. Lee was content to remain on the defensive. So, Longstreet and the Army of Northern Virginia crossed the Potomac River at Bottler's Ford and made it safely into Virginia. The Army camped near Winchester, Virginia to rest from the hard campaign over the last four months. In roughly six weeks, the ranks doubled as stragglers and those slightly wounded rejoined the ranks. Longstreet remarked that his men wished for the chance to convince the Yanks that Sharpsburg is but a trifle to what they can do. During this interlude between major engagements, the Army of Northern Virginia was reorganized, and most importantly to Longstreet, Army Corps were created, two of them, headed by two lieutenant generals. President Jefferson Davis asked Robert E. Lee to recommend two generals for those positions. Lee easily named Longstreet and Jackson, and the Confederate Senate approved Longstreet to rank from October 9th and Jackson to rank from October 10th, Longstreet still remaining the senior subordinate to Lee in the Army. One of Longstreet's biographers wrote of Jackson and Longstreet, To Jackson, duty implied fighting. Fighting implied death. Jackson accepted casualties as war's consequence. He harbored no romantic illusions about warfare. He was a remorseless enemy, a warrior in the mold of a biblical Joshua. By contrast, Longstreet approached war dispassionately. No moral imperatives, no testing of men's characters drove his generalship as they did Jackson's. To Longstreet, Victory resulted from preparation, deliberate, thoughtful planning. He believed in the strategic offensive and the tactical defensive. If Jackson was the Army's hammer, Longstreet was its anvil. To overcome the disparity in numerical strengths between the two opponents, Longstreet wanted to conserve his men's lives, not expend them in assaults. Risks had to be measured by costs. While he supported Lee's bold strategic movements, he became increasingly committed to the tactical defensive. He preferred the counterstrike to the attack. He believed that ultimately, organization and the conservation of resources, manpower, and materiel, more than the fighting qualities of the troops, would result in Confederate independence. Also during this interlude, Longstreet wrote to his friend and former commander, Joseph E. Johnston. Rumors swirled that Johnston would be sent to the Western Theater once he fully recovered from his wounds. Longstreet wrote to him that, although the officers and men had fought many battles and successfully under another leader, I feel that you have their hearts more decidedly than any other leader can ever have. The men would now go wild at the sight of their old favorite. I can't become reconciled at the idea of your going west. I command the first corps in this army. If you will take it, you are more than welcome to it. I have no doubt but the command of the entire army will fall to you before spring. If it is possible for men to relieve you by going west, don't hesitate to send me. It would put me at no great inconvenience. On the contrary, it will give me pleasure if I can relieve you of it. I fear that you ought not go where you will be exposed to the handicaps that you will meet with out there. I am yet entirely sound and believe I can endure anything. This letter is revealing. It indicates that Longstreet viewed Johnston as a superior commander to Lee, most likely because Longstreet and Johnston had similar styles of warfare, Lee being much more aggressive than the other two. Johnston serving as a corps commander would not have been realistic since he had commanded the army it would not return to a subordinate role within it. The first corps under Longstreet numbered around 41,000 men and Jackson's second corps numbered around 38,000. Longstreet possessed five divisions of men with his senior division commander being his childhood friend and West Point classmate Lafayette McClaws. The next in rank division commander in the first corps was Richard Anderson, another 1842 graduate of West Point. Moxley Sorrell described Anderson as, His courage was of the highest order, but he was indolent. His capacity and intelligence excellent, but it was hard to get him to use them. Withal of all nature, so true and lovable, that it goes against me to criticize him. John Bell Hood, George Pickett, and Robert Ransom rounded out the divisions in Longstreet's first corps. During the reorganization, one brigadier was passed over who felt he deserved to command a division. Cadmus Wilcox, a capable commander with division experience, believed he was unfairly passed over by both Hood and Pickett for division command in the First Corps. Pickett was clearly chosen by Longstreet because of their friendship, and Wilcox would never fully get over the promotion of Pickett over himself and become a harsh critic of Longstreet 
after the war for that decision. Edward Porter Alexander would join Longstreet's Corps as the commander of Stephen D. Lee's old artillery battalion when Lee was transferred to Mississippi. The bond between Alexander and Longstreet would grow as the years went on, and Alexander would be one of Longstreet's most devoted admirers and promoters. After some rest, the Union Army eventually moved into Virginia once again, but McClellan moved too slowly for Abraham Lincoln, and he was replaced by Ambrose Burnside. Lee countered the Army of the Potomac's movement by sending Longstreet and his corps to Culpeper, Virginia, and when Burnside moved east toward Fredericksburg, Lee countered by moving his corps to that town. Longstreet's troops under William Barksdale engaged with Federal troops attempting to cross the river, and once across, the fight turned into urban warfare as they battled from house to house. Longstreet put his headquarters, along with Lee, on Telegraph Hill. Concerned about the landscape's ability to provide his troops with a sufficient defensive position, he ordered trenches, abatis, and other field works to protect his troops. When Longstreet requested Porter Alexander to bring up more artillery on Mary's Heights, Alexander said, General, we cover that ground so well that we will comb it as with a fine-toothed comb. A chicken could not live on that field when we open on it. On the morning of December 13th, Longstreet mounted his horse, Hero, and rode to his division commanders. He told Hood to cooperate with Jackson's left flank and attack the Federals when they attacked Jackson's lines. He told Pickett to support Hood in this venture, then rode to Lee's headquarters. Longstreet was wearing a gray frock coat with no insignia and gray pants with a lead-colored shawl over his shoulders to keep him warm. First, McClaws joined Longstreet, then Lee, then Jackson. They discussed the upcoming fight, and as Jackson was getting ready to ride off, Longstreet asked Stonewall, Are you not scared of that file of Yankees you have before you down there? Jackson responded, Wait till they come a little nearer, and they shall either scare me or I'll scare them. Federal divisions hit Jackson's first line, then began massing and preparing to assault Mary's Heights. Wave after wave of blue troops marched up to the Confederate fortifications and melted away before the hail of lead and iron. Longstreet described it as the most fearful of carnage. During the attacks, Lee turned to Longstreet and said, General, they are massing very heavily and will break your line, I am afraid. Longstreet responded with, General, if you put every man now on the other side of the Potomac on that field to approach me over the same line and give me plenty of ammunition, I will kill them all before they reach my line. Look to your right. You are in some danger there, but not on my line. Nevertheless, Longstreet replaced some of his troops that were running low on ammunition and reinforced his positions, and the slaughter continued. Burnside eventually called off the attacks and pulled his army back across the Rappahannock River. Longstreet, Jackson, and Lee had fended off persistent attacks and won a great victory against the much larger Army of the Potomac.